Hey, good morning, y'all. Uh, I've kind of clipped my little microphone on. Can you hear me okay? Good. Hey, my name is Lisa, and I was here last week with Suzanne, and we did kind of an introductory discussion on prayer practices. And so this week, I'm kind of facilitating following up on that. And so as we start it, what I want to do is, is just kind of sum up from last time we were together, because I'm sure there's kind of ins and outs of folks, just to, to catch you up. And what we did was we talked about what does prayer mean? And we uh, came up with a simple but kind of multifaceted definition. And we decided uh, together that prayer is simply conversation with God. Within that, though, in the multiplicity of, of lenses of thinking about prayer, there were kind of two important pieces to it. And the first piece was that when, when we're in God's presence, when we're with God in this conversation, we are growing in our union with God. We're growing in our intimacy with God simply by being with him. That it's nothing that we are accomplishing. It's simply by being present to him. The, the second thing that we, we talked about as a lens of thinking about what prayer is, is that as we're in God's presence, that, that part of what is miraculously happening to us is that we're becoming more transformed into to Christ-likeness. We're becoming more transformed into the likeness of God. And so we are, we're growing in union with God, and we're becoming more like God simply by participating in conversation and being in God's presence. So this is a really, 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 really big deal that's also really, 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 really simple. But often, simple and easy are not the same thing. So we, we need to think about it. Uh, this, this need for thinking about it was really underlined to me recently. Uh, Friday, night, Friday night, I went to a concert at the Walton Art Center, and I'm going to mess up this lady's name, um, but it was Simone Dinerstein, Dinerstein. She, she played box uh, the Goldberg Variations, and it was fascinating because she said, uh, I went to this interview with her earlier before the performance, and she, she was speaking as a musician, and she, she was saying that, you know, even in music, it's so hard for two musical people to talk to each other because it can be difficult for us to understand the concepts of what we're trying to communicate. She illustrated this by saying that that afternoon, she had spent an hour and a half at the piano with, with this guy who had come in to work on the piano because she knew the sound was off. But it took them an hour and a half to simply communicate, to understand one another, to, to negotiate kind of straightening out the sound of the piano. And, and these were two folks who knew what they were talking about really in a high degree. And so it, it really made me think about how important it is not to hurry to talk about some concepts like prayer. And so, uh, so we talked about definitions. We also talked about last week about motivations and obstacles. We talked about time, we talked about distraction, we talked about uh, desire and desire for relationship with God. Within that, I told you about uh, this uh, philosophy professor who was a Christian, Dallas Willard, who was at uh, USC, and he, he did a lot of writing on spiritual practices and spiritual formation. And what he asserted that I think we'll tap into a little bit today is that it's so important in the Christian life that we have a vision for what we're doing that we understand what God is extending to us and has designed for us so that we can, we can reach for that. Because if we don't, we, we kind of live low. We live not reaching for all that God's extended for us because we simply are not sure what it is or we're not convinced that it's for us. So we need a vision for this Christian life. He would also assert that if we have a vision for the Christian life, it, it leads us to a place of intention. It stirs our desires and intentions and de causes us, hopefully, to develop, to develop means, actions, commitments to move in that direction. So vision, intention, and means. We talked about that a little bit. We ended our time last week talking about Bartimaeus, uh, which you may remember about, blind Bartimaeus, who, who, came to, who was on the side of the road, the beggar who, who yelled, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. As this was happening, the disciples got indignant, and Jesus said, bring him to me. And so kind of the, the, 
the takeaway from our time last week was this narrative of Bartimaeus because here's, here's Bartimaeus who is blind and he's standing before the Lord Jesus. And when somebody, we talked about how, you know, when somebody's blind, it's a, it's a fairly obvious deal, right? And so here's blind Bartimaeus standing in front of Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And what we were talking about was God is so committed to our relating to him, our relationship with him, that even though our needs are obvious, even though he knows what we need, he wants us to talk to him. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to relate with him. And so as, as Bartimaeus expressed that need, the Lord Jesus healed him and restored his sight. So that's kind of where we were. Um, any, any, I'm wondering, you know, I'm a little fuzzy on who was here last week and who was not, but uh, any questions or thoughts or maybe insights from the week from things we talked about last week? All right. I kind of didn't expect you to say anything, but I wanted to make space. Uh, so uh, I think what we'll do right now in, is we'll just take a moment to pray for our time together. We'll take a moment to kind of collect ourselves before God. Uh, so let me pray for us, and we'll pause with a moment of silence as we start that to, to maybe let go of where we've been and let go of where we're going and be fully present to the now. So let's pray. Lord, we do pause and we acknowledge your presence and we're grateful and ask that you would sensitize us to that reality, that you are here, that you are with us, you are among us, you are within us. Would you make us conscious of that in your uh, generosity and mercy? And Lord, would you, as only you can, would you make the most of this time together? Would you stir us by all that you extend to us as we are in your presence? It's through Christ we pray. Amen. All right. Now today, uh, there's three kind of big ideas that I want us to kind of talk about together, tease out together. The first one uh, is remind. Remind. And I, I, what we'll talk about is reminding ourselves whose presence that we're in. Whose presence are we in? The second is relate. So remind and relate. How do we, so the relate piece is how do we cultivate a mindset of relationship with God as we spend time with him. So remind, relate, and then respond. Uh, and respond has to do with our mindset of God's nature and character and who we are, uh, and a little bit of maybe prayer. How do we pray for ourselves and how do we pray for others? So remind, relate, and respond. In terms of reminding, you know, we, we talked last week about slowing down and kind of stopping to be in God's presence. And that there are distractions or uh, maybe internal dilemmas and problems that we face or concern for others. And how do we, how do, we do that? How do we, how do we kind of stop? And what, what can become so important as we, as we start to stop, right, as we start to stop, is... Uh, is reminding ourselves whose presence we're in. Now, there's a few ways that I'll, I'll suggest that you can do that, but, but before I do, let me ask you this. Um, in your maybe daily life or weekly life or in a given month, what, what are ways that you become aware of God's presence with you? What are you doing or where are you when you become aware of God's presence? Yes. Outside of nature. Yeah, being outside. That's a great one. Beholding creation. Being alone. Yeah, solitude. Good. That's great. What else? Wow. Yeah. Transitions. Yeah, that's good. Nature, transition, solitude. Anything else, Shaquille? I think that you can just take in breaks from going outside. You can get out of the house, find a place to just be in quiet, and that's 
Yeah, see, yeah, we're made in God's Im- image, and so we, we personify, we image God as verb, image. Good. Those are huge. And, and we'll come back to that, but I think part of what, what we're going to build on is that the things that we know are the ways that we become aware of God's presence, that those are the things we probably want to do more often or try to elongate or try to be more conscious of those moments. So we remind ourselves whose presence we're in. There's a, there's a few ways that can tangibly help us with that. Uh, one is uh, something we do each Sunday, and that's reading, uh, reading a creed, reading a proclamation of faith, reminding ourselves of God's nature and character, what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do. That can be a, a great reminder. And I know for me, in my time of solitude with God, one of the things that over the years has become really important because I can be so distracted is that I, I do everything out loud. I'll be all alone, but I just talk out loud. I read out loud. I pray out loud. Uh, and, and the more I find that the more senses that I can involve in my time with God, the more of kind of a, a critical mass of attention comes to pass. So maybe that also could be, you know, use a candle, use incense, uh, symbols. So, but r- perhaps reading, reading a creed. Another way to remind ourselves of uh, God's presence with us, whose presence we're in, is, is a prayer. Uh, and that can be uh, from something from the Book of Common Prayer to something more historical or traditional. Uh, there's a pilgrim's credo that Jackie Branley had brought to the Ignatius group uh, a couple years ago. And this is what it says, and uh, it's pretty profound. It says, uh, I am not in control. I am not in a hurry. I travel in faith and hope. I treat everyone with peace. I bring back only what God gives me. Kind of neat. I'm going to read that again. Okay? I am not in control. I am not in a hurry. I travel in faith and hope. I treat everyone with peace. I bring back only what God gives me. That could be a great way to to center in, to settle down and be in God's presence. The third uh, way is utilizing scripture. You know, the readings for today uh, are pretty, I mean, all the readings, right, are pretty profound, but the readings for today have some fantastic uh, they're kind of visual, right? And I'll, I'll reread just a, a, a smidge from Isaiah. Uh, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You know. You are precious in my sight. These are big realities that, that, that can help remind us of whose presence we're in and what is, what is God's heart toward us. Whose presence are we in and what is God's heart toward us? Uh, any, any thoughts or comments or questions about the remind piece? I got it from Rebecca Haas. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. I tried to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah, great. What, what else? Any other thoughts, comments? Or anything else you think of that might help remind us? I'll pause as I ask you that question. I, I teach a little bit at JBU, John Brown University, and so I'm, I'm not intimidated by your silence when I ask you a question. Okay. Uh, anyway, all right, so... So there's a remind piece. So remind, relate. And this, this relate piece is, is just a fascinating and overwhelming part. That uh, if we don't have a vision for our relationship with God, we can kind of live, let's say what God extends to us is up here, right? This is just Christian reality for everybody. 
But if we don't understand or are not aware of what he extends to us, we kind of live here, and our expectations are met pretty easily because we really probably don't really have any. I would say a lot of Christians walk around and they have really no expectations of their spirituality. Not that they have to earn something, but they just need to respond. Uh, and so w- let me just throw out a couple of concepts about this relationship with God that we have, this Christian spirituality, which is uh, crazy. And I mean that with great uh, reverence. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so in John 17, John 17, 3, Jesus is speaking here. And this part of John is where uh, it's referred to this chapter as uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer. It's just kind of his last time with the disciples before he's portrayed and crucified. And so this is nitty-gritty time. You know, he's talking with the disciples. And the chapter is... What's also neat about the chapter is it starts where he's talking to them, and then he's praying for them, but then later in the chapter he's praying actually for us. He's praying for all who will believe, ever. So, but at this beginning part, he's kind of proclaiming reality, and he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus is saying, this is eternal life, that they may know you. And what's uh, crazy about that word no is uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, it's yada, and it's translated, transliterated into the Greek, and it's gnosko here. But uh, it's the word, I feel kind of funny saying this in church, it's the word for sex. It's, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, if, they, if the phrase is Adam knew Eve, they're, they're saying, well, you know, Adam and Eve had sex. And so, uh, now I'm not saying that our relationship with God is sex with God, but I am saying that what God has designed us to know and what is being spoken of as normal is that our relationship with God is one of experiential union. It's, it's, it's something that we're conscious of. And that Jesus is describing that as the normal Christian life. He's not saying that's for special spiritual people. That the normal Christian life is conscious experiential union with God. Wow, that's a big deal. Uh, and then later in that same chapter uh, as he's praying for all believers praying for you uh, let me find it I'm in a stranger bible to me right now Uh, I do not ask on behalf of these alone but for those who believe in me through their word that they may all be one even as you, Father, now this gets tricky, but listen for the word in, okay? Uh, Even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you have loved me. Now, In there, uh, there's a lot of craziness. So we've talked about uh, relationship with God being experiential union with God, but but now part of what what Jesus is kind of showing, saying as normal, is that, you know, your expectations can be pretty high in your relationship with God because the intimacy that exists within the Trinity is that, that relationship within the Trinity, that same substance of experience of that, between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the same substance with which God relates to us. It's the same love. It's the same, the, the same experience of love that exists within the Trinity is the same experience of love that we can have with God. And that that's normal. Does that make sense? It's a big deal, right? So, so as we remind ourselves whose presence we're in and we are aware of the, the great extravagance of what God extends to us, we may just lean into wanting that and experiencing that conscious union with God and knowing his love for us, which is the same love which exists within the Trinity. It's gigantic. And hopefully, here we are back to Dallas Willard, this vision, right? So that kind of casts a vision for our relating with God. And maybe will stir some intention and maybe some means or application or action. 
so that was a that was a mouthful of information to tell you. What uh, any questions or thoughts or kind of weirdnesses or even you might be creeped out, right? I said some crazy things to you. Thoughts or comments? Yes, yeah. And you know, it's, it, it, the word intimacy is funny because it's just in, right? There's this in again that we kept hearing, in. God and me, I and God. Other thoughts? Comments? Weirdnesses? Okay. All right, so we've got this idea of reminding and relating. And then uh, this concept of response, uh, to respond. Uh, you know, before I, I get there, the, uh, before I get there, let me pause and just just insert one other thought in terms of this uh, kind of this bridge between relating and response. And I would say that as we uh, are in God's presence, we're conscious of who we're with, and we're aware of what He extends to us. You know, whenever we quiet down, uh, our internal dialogue can get kind of, or monologue really, our internal monologue can get kind of loud. And it can be uh, filled with, when we stop, I mean, there's a lot that can be filled with our daily tasks or commitments or responsibilities, demands. But it can also, as we stop, what will bubble up fairly quickly is things that we think about God that aren't true and things that we think about ourselves that aren't true. Uh, and I just want to pause and acknowledge that, because I, it can uh, sidetrack you, because uh, one of the things that can really mess us up spiritually is that all of us, all of us have what I would call uh, false settled ideas, spiritually. So there's things that we've decided are true about God, and there's things we've decided are true about ourselves that just aren't. They're just false, subtle ideas, false beliefs, really. So uh, when we when we stop before the Lord, those uh, kind of come to the front. And I'll give you an example of why. You know, I know that Lowell is uh, working through Colossians, typically, right now. But uh, in Colossians 2, let me find it here or it might be one, yeah, one, uh, chapter one, verse 21. It, you know, it's interesting in this chapter, uh, Paul is describing all the miraculous craziness that God has done for us and with us and to us and through us. And, but in verse 21 he says, uh, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. You were formerly alienated and hostile in mind. So there's this idea, those are huge words, that, that as we're, we're kind of trying to bring all of ourselves before God's presence, we're going we're gonna to encounter the places where we quite literally are alienated in mind, hostile in mind toward God and toward ourselves. Uh, and that's a reality of ongoing transformation that we, we lean toward. And so as those things come up, and you know, each of these things I'm bringing up today, they're, they're really deep concepts that we could spend a lot of time, but I just want to kind of put them out there, but uh, there could be cans of worms that I open that could need more discussion, and I'm available for that. But... Uh, you know, in God's economy, all of our freedom comes through uh, forgiveness, right? So if we're, we have a false idea about life, God, or ourselves, our way through that is, is repentance and confession. We, we, we acknowledge to God the untruth we believe, and we, we let go of it, and we ask forgiveness, and we ask for truth. We name the truth, and we sit with the truth. We try to receive the truth. So that, that may become a part of your silence or a part of your reminding and relating as you're journeying. Does that make sense? Any questions or thoughts on that? Or are you with me or are you far, far away? Nodding's good. Okay, great. All right. All right. So, uh, so we'll go into uh, the response piece. 
And, you know, in my own spiritual journey, the, the thing, one of the things I really love about the Episcopal tradition is that uh, there's so many things, but one of the things I like is that through the Book of Common Prayer and, and the liturgy, the work of the people, that there's, uh, there's a posture of responding to God, that there's not a uh, crisis-oriented initiating with God and taking responsibility for anything to happen uh, in our lives or in the lives of others. Now, I'm not saying that we don't go there sometimes emotionally and mentally, but, uh, but the posture is one of responding instead of initiating. And when we, we respond instead of initiate, we can rest and receive instead of kind of gritting our teeth and gearing up to do something or to do it right, or to do it enough, or to pray harder. Uh, you know, my mom has some uh, spirituality, and her view of church is uh, scary <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but what, you know, she, you know, I was visiting them over Christmas, and there was a time she had missed church, and she was in tears, afraid that God was going to punish her because she'd missed church. And uh, I just thought, wow, you know, she's just doesn't feel like she's doing it right and she's not doing enough. And, and that's certainly not a response posture, right? Certainly not a receiving posture. And so kind of counter-cultural and even counter-spiritual cultural in terms of uh, where we live, not necessarily the Episcopal tradition, but our view of Christian spirituality in our country, uh, to respond instead of pursue or initiate is, is, is just a part of mentality that's helpful to be aware of and can give us great freedom to be. You know, this intimacy with God we talked about and this reality of his presence with us, that's not something we earn. It's just something we, we step into and become conscious of, right? We remind ourselves of. So this idea of response. Does that make sense, this response piece? Great. All right, so, uh, so we've got, uh, we've talked about remind relate, respond. And my hope, as I said at the beginning, is uh, that you would be stirred in your vision for being with God, that perhaps as you're uh, either reminded or refreshed or have an, an aha about God's intention and desire or extravagance towards you, that you would be moved in intention and that you'd be moved into this means piece or this action point, this response piece. Uh, so I want to come back to uh, the question I, I said toward the beginning. How do, what are ways that we already know that we uh, become aware of God's presence? And I think what I'd like to ask us to do right now is just, just from what you know, you've heard today and what maybe you're thinking, uh, how could that intersect with your awareness of God's presence? And how do you, how do you kind of grow that? How do, you, how do you maybe do that more frequently? Or how do you in, elongate your, your experience of that? So let, let's just uh, pause for a moment of silence. And then what I'd like to do is kind of go back through kind of a, in, in an attitude of prayer uh, kind of this remind and relate and respond piece. And I'll, I'll kind of just guide us through that for a few minutes together. Does that make sense? So we'll reflect on, we'll, so, what, so what? What does this mean for you? And then I'll just, I'll kinda, what I'll do is I'll interrupt you, right? <laughs> and I'll start to guide us through what we've been talking about, where you can silently uh, participate. All right? Great. All right. So... You do your part, and I'll interrupt you in a moment.
I'm going to start my interruption of you with a uh, poem from a book by Jan Richardson, who's one of my favorite authors. She's a, a Methodist minister, and she's done a lot of uh, writing of poems and reflections. Great author to help you connect with God's presence. So uh, as we begin to kind of journey through some, some of this being in God's presence stuff, this is how we'll start it, and then I'll continue to guide us, okay? This is called The Shimmering Hours, and it's rooted in this epiphany season. And we're journeying. Uh, the Shimmering Hours. There is so much I want to say as if the saying could prepare you for this path, as if there were anything I could offer that would make your way less circuitous, more smooth. Once you step out, you will see for yourself how nothing could have made you ready for this road that will take you from what you know to what you cannot perceive, except, perhaps, in your dreaming as it gives a glimpse in prayer. But I can tell you this journey is not about miles. It's not about how far you can walk or how fast. It is about what you will do with this moment, this star that blazes in your sky, though no one else might see. So open your heart to these shimmering hours by which your path is made. Open your eyes to the light that shines and what you will need to see. Open your hands to those who go with you, those seen and those known only by their blessing, their benediction of the road that is your own. And we'll just sit in silence for a moment or two in between my interruption. I am not in control. I am not in a hurry. I travel in faith and hope. I treat everyone with peace. I bring back only what God gives me. And then this relating piece. Here's a, a passage from John 14 to further heighten our awareness of God's heart toward us. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him.
to the, the respond piece, and my guess there's things on your mind, in your person, in your life, in your view of God, uh, to respond to, not to solve, but to talk to God about. And so I, I'd ask that you'd use this time. And, and kind of as a word picture for this, I would say that, you know, what can happen when we have things on our mind, we can become like a, a bowl that kind of gets full of water, and it just holds it, and that can be overwhelming. Uh, but think of, think of those things that are filling, filling you or overwhelming you as, you know, be more of a, a colander, you know, when you make noodles, you know, and you, it just goes through, you don't hold it. So be a colander of prayer, how's that? So respond to what's on your mind and in your heart, and then I'll close us. I'll close our time with uh, a prayer from Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Amen. Uh, yeah, so there you have it. Uh, we're a little early just because we are, but um, if you guys have any thoughts or questions, I'd love to be available to you, but thanks for being here. Yeah.